Good evening or good morning to at least one of you. Um, welcome to Night School. I'm Christina. I'm Arya. And um, we're streaming to you um, from our homes, but on behalf of the California Academy of Sciences and Nightlife, which is our Thursday evening event bringing science and art and culture to you, which is actually going on at the Academy right now. Um, it's a bee themed nightlife. So, um, but here tonight, you're going to hear about how humans and nature converge in the Bay Area um, with a look at several case studies and how humans have impacted life in San Francisco and beyond and what's next. And one of the reasons that we are doing this theme this week is next weekend is the City Nature Challenge, which is a global event to document um, your local biodiversity. So go to citynaturechallenge.org um, to learn about that. Aria, who do we have tonight? Yes, in order of appearance, uh, we first have Academy, the Academy's Senior Research Fellow, uh, Dr. Darrell Kapan, uh, and our Entomology Collections Manager, Chris Grinter, um, both sharing about their work to bring back the presence of a Bay Area butterfly that was actually driven to extinction in the 1930s. Um, and then following that, we have Allison Young, who's the co-director of the Academy's Center for Bio for Biodiversity and Community Science, and Dr. Sarah Jacobs, our Curator of Botany, sharing about Yerba Buena Island and some of the Academy's past, ongoing, and potential future work there. Um, and then closing us out is a wonderful returning speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Schell, who is an Assistant Professor at UC Berkeley, sharing about how coyotes and more animals across the Bay Area um, intersect with human life and about how humans ourselves are a pretty important part of nature too. So I will and ask he about. just promised us brand new uh, <laughs> camera footage. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Um, and as always, tonight's program is live. So 
say hello. Those of you who haven't said hi yet, um, let us know where you're watching from and drop any Q and A's or not A's, <laughs> drop any cues you have in the chat. Um, and after each presenter, we'll do a short Q and A. So, okay. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Darrell Caban. Darrell, you're muted. You gotta unmute that. There you go. Okay, no worries. Hi, everyone. Sound good? Okay. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the first species of invertebrate that went extinct due to human caused habitat modification in the North America that we know of. And um, this species, known as the Xerxes blue, is a small butterfly that we'll get to peek at um, actual specimens of it a little bit later. Let's see if I can advance the slides here. There we go. So there's a picture of the Xerxes blue. It's a small butterfly in the Lysinidae family. These are tiny blue butterflies that flit about um, and they feed on a few host plants. They have special relationships with other arthropods. And this particular taxon um, went extinct right here, right where I'm sitting at the California Academy of Sciences, straight down to the beach, up to the Presidio, and down to Lake Merritt. That was what its range was. So some of the things we want to know about, um, oh, let me just go back really quickly. So I'm gonna give you the 20 second summary of what happened. Before um, San Francisco was built out, um, before and after the 1906 earthquake, the Xerxes blue was found in dune habitats and it was munching as a larvae on a few species of plant, but specifically one I'll show you a little later called the deer weed. That dune habitat was also prime real estate for development. And as the um, city marched west into the outer lands where we're sitting now, um, those dunes were converted to a variety of things, including houses and parks like the park we're in with non-dune denizens, many non-native species. That's what drove the Xerxes blue extinct. And uh, we have evidence of the decline in our collection. So we're kind of really interested in knowing what was this species or taxon. And I'm using that word for uh, organism of any taxonomic level. And what did it do special in San Francisco? And is there any way we could bring back the ecological function of this species? And so we're going to use a few, a few um, questions to, uh, to get to this. So what did it look like? Where was it found? What did it eat as a larvae? And what the females placed the eggs on so that the larvae had the right food? What kind of climate did it inhabit? And ultimately, are there similar taxa or other similar species that we could use to sort of bring this taxon back? And I'm gonna go from the simplest idea is just introducing the closest relative to the craziest idea, hopefully in the discussion of maybe if Xerxes has some uniqueness that it, that's no longer out there in any other species, the idea of sort of making a Jurassic Park project out of it. But let's just get, get with it. So what did Xerxes look like? It's a little blue butterfly, just a little bit bigger than maybe a combination of my thumbs and my pinkies together for those two wings. Thumbnail, pinkies, pinky fingernail, and, and literally um, tiny. The underside was its distinctive um, difference. So on the on the dorsum, we have Xerxes on the left and uh, the upper side of the closest relative that we that we're looking at, which is called the silvery blue butterfly with different named um, subspecies there, incognita, sabulosa, and australis. They look very similar. The females look different, but they also have a range of variation in the Xerxes female does not look that different from the top or the dorsal part of the wings. But on the ventral side, 
Xerxes could range from looking pretty similar, although a lot duskier, to the silvery blue, which are the, the three on the right. But ultimately, the real um, uh, interesting uh, forms of Xerxes we found out there had no black pigmentation underneath the wings. So where were these found? Well, the silvery blue butterflies found all over California and actually all over North America. Here are some of the named types. And then the red pin is where Xerxes was found. And I just described it a second ago, basically from the Presidio to Lake Merritt. Um, the Presidio is really interesting. As a federal land, it has been undergoing, um, it, it had a, a massive, amount of habitat disturbance over its history, but it's, it's, a, it's a standout place for habitat restoration now. And if we look carefully, um, we see some spots here that I see some small pins on the right-hand side where the host plant for Xerxes has been reestablished. And that's this deerweed species. So what were the hosts? Deerweed, lupin and a few other species that the larvae would eat and what were the environments well for xerxes it was cool and foggy but for silvery blue it can range from coastal environments to warm and dry environments and up into higher altitudes so how do we find a butterfly that would be most capable of surviving in the presidio if we let it go there so first we're going to look in a little bit at the lobo stunes and um Lobos Creek restoration. Here are some iNaturalist records, and that's this, um, I don't know if you can see me, but basically this phone app and social network for sharing natural history data, which you'll hear more about. And um, those are records for the deerweed. And there's a picture of it. So that's the host that Xerxes was feeding on up until it went extinct right around the beginning of World War II. Now you can see the um, restoration in here includes deerweed and lupin and other coastal scrub species. And when we go out to look, we hope someday to find the species, silvery blues that we've transplanted out there. But right now our project's in the stage of looking for populations of this similar species elsewhere to, to, to potentially um, transplant into the Presidio. So where are we finding the host plant for um, Xerxes? Well around the Bay Area, including in Marin and down South. And where are we finding the silvery blue? Everywhere except for San Francisco, you can see it's kind of a bit of a hole. There's no silvery blues marked by the red pins on the right in San Francisco. So our job is to go find populations of silvery blues and then compare them to the genetic um, signatures of Xerxes that we're getting from the collection. So what is this big collection we're going to look at in a minute? Well, there are hundreds of Xerxes and thousands of silvery blues in our collection. And this is pretty interesting because this is actually kind of a microcosm of what the museum is all about. These are sort of proof positive that this species, this taxon existed in those places I mentioned at those times, but before the World War II and back into the 1800s. That's pretty amazing because it's really hard these days to, to uh, all agree upon one thing. If we look at the label, and Chris will show us a bit of that, about that, we could read exactly where it was collected, when it was collected, and who collected it. And then by looking at the actual specimen, we can say what it is. So, but how do we get a little more detail than just the label? We're doing a sort of a two-phase genomic search. So we're, I don't want you to look at all the details, but basically we take DNA from the specimens here and we don't destroy the entire specimens. We just use a few legs from the left side of the body. And we do the basic workflow to, that you would do for 23andMe. We sequence the, the, the DNA and then we um, first aligned it to a distant species, found enough DNA in common, it's kind of like a pickup sticks game, enough piles of DNA that we could then analyze. And then we found, wow, silvery blues from near San Jose are really close. Then we sequenced the entire genome of the silvery blue 
from San Jose, redid the analysis. And we're right at this point where we're saying, wow, our museum specimens of silvery blue that are closest to Xerxes are from a little bit further south in the peninsula between here and San Jose for all genes that don't necessarily have a function for random genes. But now we wanna go out and look for field samples to see if those, those, those specimens that we found from the museum are actually still looking like that where they're found. This is a, a specimen from Marin, but we just saw some just south of San Francisco just about a week ago. But, now, but, but let me just give you a tiny summary of the genomic data. So our first analysis basically um, suggested that Xerxes, which are in red on the far right tree diagram that we have here, are similar to one of those name types called incognitus and a few other ones. And they're not uniquely distinct. In other words, you can see they're part of a group, we call that a clade, that includes a couple of different name types. So they're definitely one of the silvery blue butterfly subspecies. And then when we look at this kind of funny uh, graph in the middle, we can say, were there two groups? These are all, all the columns of this graph are individuals that we genome sequenced. And if we said, are there two groups? Xerxes forms a group, that's that green, and the rest of them form a different group. And if you look, there's a little bit of blue poking into the green. And if we say, if there's, are there three groups? And we start to re recover something from Southern California and Xerxes, and then a little bit of a, a mix up. That looks like th two or three groups are essentially looks like Xerxes is something distinct, but possibly not a species. And then this is on the far left, just to getting a little bit of, it's a little bit behind in how I introduce this, but this was actually the, z the genome of, of the um, silvery blue that we sequenced in order to align all these DNA data. So the, the short and sweet final answer is that we're gonna be looking in the South Peninsula for sp species that are, are, are taxa, silvery blue types, incognitus, that are similar, but we're also gonna delve into thing, genes that might be important for the host plant and the habitat, including the foggy cold habitat. And we'll do that by comparing other populations from Marin and from further south in Monterey. So that's pretty much all I have to tell you. Um, you can see these groups kind of mapped out there. So that might be helped a little bit. Um, why are we doing all this? Well, I think that the idea of restoring a single butterfly, it's possibly not even a unique species, but was an, a unique form that went extinct um, early in the, in the history of, uh, of entomology for California is, uh, is pretty neat on its own, but it's more important. It's more of a, a kind of, I see it as sort of a, if we can do this, we are actually uh, can inspire a whole group of whole generation of people to think about how to repair or restore the environment, um, consistent with the Academy's mis mission to regenerate the natural world. All the restoration areas that I um, talked to you about were replanted with volunteer labor. Many, many school kids helped. And butterflies are amazingly inspiring for children, for adults. and and uh, this small, small butterfly could potentially excite us to make bigger changes in our society. So thanks to all the team, just really quickly, Chris is right there next to me on the left. David has been doing a lot of the curation and history and helping select specimens. Athena from the Center for Comparative Genomics, our director there, did all the DNA extraction, all the sequencing. Jim has helped immensely with the genome sequencing. and. Uh, a great partner in all ways. And Matt has been doing a lot of the genomic analysis with me. So thank you a lot. And I'm gonna pass it off to Chris and the collection. Thanks, Darrell, that was great. And welcome everyone from the basement of the California Academy, uh, where I'm down here today showing you some of the actual Xerxes blue specimens that we have in our holdings. And in short, we have over 8 million uh, specimens in the pin dried collection like this, and many um, hundreds of thousands of Lepidoptera or butterflies and moths. And these are a few of our Xerxes specimens from here in San Francisco. You can see the handwriting on some of these labels here. Check that one. 
here that you can see, or if you look closely, it says San Francisco, June 23rd, 1935. June is actually a very late date for the Circe's blue. And it's interesting because this is such an extreme habitat. So San Francisco is cold and windy and, and not very hospitable for butterflies flying out in the sunshine. And June is really late for a springtime butterfly. And usually they're flying up in the, you know, as Jarrell was talking about these other spe uh, subspecies of uh, silvery blues that fly all the way from the deserts across Canada, throughout the United States. But um, here in San Francisco, it's a very unique habitat. And so they would fly all the way up until June, which was really interesting. But we have specimens as old as uh, 19, 1900. I think we have a few from 18, 1890s. Some of them you can see are not in the best condition, but that is not important necessarily for a scientific specimen. So we have fortunately saved every Xerxes blue. We treat them very preciously now. So as part of this extraction protocol that Darrell talked a little bit about, we're not crushing or grinding up any of these, these irreplaceable butterflies. We're actually just soaking a few of their legs in a little bit of buffer. We're extracting their DNA and we're saving the legs with the specimens for future, at least morphological work or something. So we'll be able to go back and, and study the, the structure of the legs if we need to in the future. Uh, definitely preserving every specimen that we possibly can. You can see some of the nice bright white spots on the underside of the Xerxes. And so on the upper corner here, we have a male. And that is the bright blue upper side surface there. And then this other specimens are pinned upside down. So that's the, the ventral side or the underside with the white spots. And then down here we have females and females lack the bright blue coloration of the males. And this is true mostly for um, a lot of the blue butterflies in the genus Glaucosyche or across a lot of Lycaenids, they're sexually dimorphic or males and females uh, look different than, um, that look different from each other. And so males um, are brightly blue colored. They're using that bright blue color to attract females. They're defending territory often, flying around, competing with each other, getting eaten by birds most often. Uh, females are darker colored, usually, especially in a coastal, you know, windy, cold environment, it's better to absorb heat from the sun, uh, help with egg production, and they're usually more cryptic, or they'll not be as obvious flying around flowers, competing, getting eaten, things like that. Um, but this is just part of the many specimens of the Xerxes that we have here at the Academy. See some of them look like they've been taken out of nests or spiders webs or been attacked by birds. But, you know, a research collection is important from every, every animal, every, you know, sometimes we find them even dead in the field. We'll collect those specimens. They can be really informative for all sorts of research purposes. And then I have a few other butterflies from uh, the Bay Area, you know, City and Nature Challenge will be out looking for a lot of things like this. So here we have, we could switch over to the main screen here. We've got uh, the butterflies of San Bruno Mountain. So this is a collection that was put together several years ago that represents some of the Bay Area's local butterflies. And so it's important to get out and document them the best we can over the next few weeks. Our collections include lots of species like this. We've got green hair streaks. I'll pull one out here and show you quickly. Let's see. So here is our incognitus blue. So this is one of the um, relatives um, of the Xerxes blue that Drell was talking about. And so these are the populations that Drell was talking about that we're looking at uh, in the genomics to try and figure out the best uh, substitute to replace the Xerxes. I see a question I could 
jump on quickly. Um, the mission blue is endangered. So the mission blue is a federally protected species. Um, we'll actually have a few in this tray right now if we have a minute. I don't know if we've got a ton of time, but um, this is the mission blue for some side of this. No, it's not gonna, it's not gonna quite fit on the screen. Um, but yes, the mission blue is related to the Xerxes blue. It's in a different genus, uh, it's Icarissia, and they live in very similar habitats. So Darrell and I were in the field a few weeks ago and um, a relative of the mission blue, the Pardalis blue, which occurs southern, uh, the southern portion of the peninsula, uh, was in a different habitat. So it was on the higher ridge lines, more like Twin Peaks. And then we were closer in the riparian zone along the creeks and rivers where we were catching the glycosite the silvery blues. So with Great. that, I think we can do some. Yeah, let's bring Daryl back. Yeah, thanks so much, you two. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how? So you said something interesting, Daryl, about picking um, specimens for for DNA ex DNA extraction. The extraction. What makes a specimen good for that? So I think that if you remember the map I had, we're, we're basically, we started with no idea. We thought mm -hmm. um, uh, taxon, well, I wouldn't say no idea. Taxonomists would say that Xerxes was uh, like a equivalent to one of those other named races, maybe a little, or subspecies, maybe a little more distinct than that. So we knew it was close to silvery blues. So what we did was we, we wanted to create a measuring stick a uh, variation within silvery blue and then place Xerxes on that on that line wherever it goes. And so what we did is we went we went to the collection, but it's like a virtual field trip all the way to northern Mexico, into the mountains east of here, and up to Mendocino and maybe up to um Arcata. And we collected uh all those different named subspecies of the silvery blue, Glaucopsyche, Ligdemus, Incognitus, Sabulosa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also, with that very careful soaking of the DNA of the legs, we did that for a silvery blue. So we, and so we only have maybe um, 24 specimens total with seven of this, I mean, of the Xerxes blue. And the analysis basically showed that the Xerxes was kind of distinct, but part of that whole group. Mm -hmm. So that's not surprising. But remember that the genome of a butterfly like this is pretty large. It's about um, one sixth the size of the human genome. And so there's a lot of base pairs to go through. We have 24 yeah. chromosomes and we create some big files for each chromosome. And we have to go through every variable site in the genome. Mm -hmm. And so we're, um, we're likely to find things that Xerxes was you was unique for if we do a good enough job. Okay. Great. Um, and Chris, how did all these uh, Xerxes specimens come to the Academy? And do we have, is it the largest collection of the species or? Yeah, it's definitely the largest collection. I mean, they flew here in the park and they flew yeah. where we are standing as a museum, you know, up until the 1940s. And, you know, even in the 20s, our Academy curators were noticing that the Xerxes blue was becoming extinct. I mean, they, mm. it was written about, you know, for a long time that this once abundant butterfly has now been, you know, restricted to relic populations in the city. And I think the last truly pristine patch of original San Francisco dune site was paved over in the 1960s. So up until then, there was still like a little tiny patch of original habitat. Um, and so it was super common here. If you go anywhere in California along the coast, you can find common blue butterflies. Mm -hmm. And they're very isolated in these little pockets because it's an extreme habitat if you're a delicate butterfly. You know, they might not have even been able to fly across the Golden Gate. So it's interesting to think of how they moved about in populations and how they were able to breed or interbreed and how they became isolated and all this over time. Yeah. Um, and so how do you, how, if this is successful, um, how do you go about like transplanting butterflies? Um, what does habitat restoration and like attracting them look like? 
So I'm, I'm excited. Our partners at the Presidio are already doing this. So in addition to um, preserving mission blue habitat, they're, they're moving um, other butterflies into the Presidio from nearby populations like um, the ringlet, the common ringlet from Marin to, to the Presidio. So first step is to put the habitat there. You need the host plant and you need adult nectar plants in the proper habitat structure, hopefully in the right environment. Like even the slope, which way is the hill sloping? The ringlet needs grasses. So there's a grassy area by Inspiration Point, just up the hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look off of Inspiration Point, they have ringlets there. Please don't walk around there, but you can stay on the trail and look for them. They're marked right now. And um, uh, Jonathan Young, the biologist I was talking to, he basically is um, finding uh, source populations, marking them, and then moving them at the right time for the females to lay eggs um, which would be right now, basically, into the target population. And then they use a marker, which I've been doing since I was a, a grad student and I studied <laughs> tropical butterflies. We mark the wings um, with a, a Sharpie marker, very delicately with a ringlet. The Xerxes or silvery blue would be really hard to do because they're very delicate. But then he follows those marked butterflies. Wow. And they have had success. They overwintered and they have a ne another generation. So that's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing this project. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll be sharing more about it through various academy channels as it as it progresses. And um, yeah, thanks so much for being here tonight. And um, Chris, have fun with the rest of nightlife with your beat. Yeah, for anyone in San Francisco, come <laughs> upstairs. I'm up there with some uh, staff members tonight for nightlife. Yeah. All thank right. you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks, hey, everyone. Bye. I forgot to introduce our next guests, um, which are Al, who are Allison Young and Dr. Sarah Jacobs. Hello, let me get my Hello. screen up. All right. Excellent, great. Um, well, I am going to uh, kick us off here on this uh, two-part talk uh, about Yerba Buena Island and the natural history research that myself and Sarah Jacobs um, have been doing uh, out on the island. I've been doing um, some marine and, inter and intertidal research out there, and Sarah has been studying um, plant community on Yerba Buena Island itself. Um, but before I go too far, I would be really interested, those of you that are listening in, are watching this presentation, how many of you have explored Yerba Buena Island at all? So not just driven through the tunnel um, and not talking not talking about Treasure Island, I would be interested to know, you can put a little comment um, to let us know if you've actually explored uh, Yerba Buena Island itself at all. Uh, so starting off, I wanna give a quick little history of Yerba Buena Island and, and what makes it so interesting. Uh, you know, th who lived there before the Spanish is still kind of uncertain, but uh, we know for sure that the island was used as a fishing camp and a place for gathering acorns by the Ohlone. Uh, the name uh, La Isla de la Yerba Buena was actually given um, by Spanish colonists around 1795 um, in reference to a fragrant plant in the mint family uh, that grows uh, around the Bay Area. Uh, the Army had a base on the island starting in the 1860s, uh, which they handed over to the Navy. Uh, and the Navy pretty much owned Yerba Buena Island from uh, the early 1900s to 1997, um, when the process of decommissioning it and actually Treasure Island as well at the same time um, and transferring the land to the city started. Uh, the Coast Guard moved on to a third of the island in 1973, basically from the Bay Bridge south, um, and they still occupy uh, that third of the island. And the really interesting thing, though, is that uh, because Yerba Buena Island was basically under naval control for so long that as the rest of the San Francisco Bay Area was being developed, even though it's super close to San Francisco, it was not developed in the same way. Um, and so there are these pocket remnants of the original habitats, um, like oak woodlands and tide pools and coastal and riparian scrub on the island. Um, one key bit of history that I have to point out in particular, because I'm talking about kind of the marine side of Yerba Buena Island, uh, is the construction of Treasure Island, uh, which started in 1936. And basically, they dredged a whole bunch of mud and silt from the 
San Francisco Bay and dumped it on top of a natural shoal, actually called Yerba Buena Shoals, um, right off, right to the north of Yerba Buena Island to create Treasure Island. Um, and Treasure Island was uh, finished in 1937. Um, but as uh, a marine biologist, I constantly think about how the the finishing, the building of the island, and especially the causeway that connects Yerba Buena Island to Treasure Island, how that must have really changed uh, kind of the marine influence and currents around Yerba Buena Island, especially in Clipper Cove, which is part of the part of Yerba Buena Island that directly faces uh, Treasure Island. Uh, you know, when I first started um, exploring Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island, it was about 2016, um, and this is what it looked like um, back then. And this basically is the immediate future of Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island, um, that there's this new sustainable uh, neighborhood development going in on both of the islands that's going to bring a whole bunch of new residences to the islands, new office buildings, um, like 300 acres of parks and open spaces, and also a new ferry terminal that actually just opened um, on Treasure Island as well. But as part of this sustainable development, the Treasure Island Development Authority and the city of San Francisco is really committed to understanding the ecosystems and biodiversity of the islands, especially of Yerba Buena Island, because it is a natural island. Um, and they want to basically understand the biodiversity so that they can best manage for it and protect it going forward as this development is happening. So the Treasure Island Development Authority in the city of San Francisco asked myself and my co-director, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, to basically do uh, surveys of the inner tidal of Yerba Buena Island uh, to build a species list. So they understood the biodiversity of these places. The inner tidal is the uh, strip along the coast that during low tide is uncovered um, and during high tide is covered with water. Um, so we basically explored as much of the coast of Yerba Buena Island as we uh, possibly could, except for the areas of the Coast Guard, um, which we're not allowed on. Uh, so some of the places that we went and um, surveyed and explored are places like this, which is Clipper Cove, uh, which has a really wide sandy beach that as you kind of curve around to the Bay Bridge, uh, turns more rocky. Um, and on a good low tide, you can actually walk all the way to the Bay Bridge. We also did surveys directly underneath the Bay Bridge. Uh, there's a historic building under there called the Torpedo Storehouse and um, lots of bouldery riprap that we surveyed. And on Western Yerba Buena Island, um, there are some coves that you can only get to by boat. Uh, so we took boats out to those coves um, and surveyed the biodiversity there. So basically what we spent a lot of time doing was walking through the intertidal documenting all the species we could find um, and kind of looking under those rocks and, and cobbly places as well to find the species living in those spaces. Um, as part of those surveys, we also did a little bit of um, subtitle work by looking at the uh, fowling community, which is the species that grow on man-made surfaces um, on, in tre the Treasure Island Marina. So looking underneath the docks and the things that hang off of the docks um, as well to see what was growing on them. Uh, it tends to be a lot of, in San Francisco Bay especially, it tends to be a lot of non-native species, but still quite beautiful. These are uh, two photos um, from our surveys of the Treasure Island Marina. Um, and then also really fun, we got to uh, go do some uh, subtitle surveys of a eelgrass bed that's along the east bay of Treasure Island, the east side of Treasure Island, and in the Clipper Cove area as well by using this little ROV or this underwater drone. Um, and that gave us um, views of things like sea pens, which grow um, around Treasure Island and in Clipper Cove, and also some eelgrass associated species, um, like this beautiful little uh, sea slug called a Taylor's sea hare. So in total, through all these surveys that we did um, in the Yerba Buena Island intertidal and a little bit of the subtitle, uh, we were able to document 198 species, primarily marine invertebrates and algae. Like we weren't even there to survey the birds or the fish or the marine mammals. So just talking about invertebrates and algae, uh, found 198 species uh, growing on Yerba Buena Island or living in Yerba Buena Island, the intertidal. Um, and what we were really excited about is that we actually found through these surveys seven species that had never previously been documented in the entirety of San Francisco Bay. So this is going back and looking at historic surveys, going and looking at museum collections uh, to see what was found from, from the entirety of San Francisco Bay. And the fact that we found seven species um, that had never before been documented was pretty exciting. All seven of those species we found on Western Yerba Buena Island, which from this picture here, um, you know, if you didn't have the Bay Bridge in the city of San Francisco right in front of you, actually looks like kind of an outer coast and open coast site where you have like muscle beds and rocky areas. 
Um, and so since Western Yerbabuena Island is really basically faces the opening of the Golden Gate, it gets a lot of marine influence and is a really kind of unique place within San Francisco Bay. Um, so those seven species we were really excited to find, I'm going to quickly just go through them. Uh, this little Esmark's brittle star, this beautiful chitin called a flame-lined chitin, uh, this polychaete worm that builds like a tube and a basket looking <laughs> kind of head hood for its head, uh, the fringe hood uh, spaghetti worm, this beautiful snail called the glorious top snail, little crab, the chocolate porcelain crab, um, another snail, the onyx slipper snail, um, and then a species of sponge that's actually newly described, currently being described, uh, that we also found on Western Yerba Buena Island. And Rebecca and I, you know, we're both marine biologists, so we're, it's always really exciting to get new records, especially for a place as large as San Francisco Bay. But I think we're actually more excited by the message in the bottle that we found on Western Yerba Buena Island, that both of us have been working in the intertidal and along the coast of California for over 20 years, and neither of us had ever found a message in a bottle before. Um, it turned out to be a really sweet memorial to someone who had died the year before, um, but interestingly had only been, they had tossed it into the water from San Francisco less than a week before we found it. Um, and so we're guessing they must have tossed it in when the tide was coming in, and that high tide basically pushed it directly to Yerba Buena Island. Um, so knowing that they probably meant for it to be like out in the open ocean, we put the whole thing back together and actually on a trip to the Mendocino coast, put it back in the water for them. And one of the most interesting things that we found as we were doing these surveys of Yerba Buena Island is that there are these really um, interesting natural rocky points. You know, there's not a lot of natural rock left in San Francisco Bay, um, but Yerba Buena on the western side and in Clipper Cove has these natural rocky points. And these are the places that we actually found kind of the highest biodiversity and the most native species richness around these points. And really interestingly is when we turned and kind of looked from these natural points away from the ocean and then up above it, what we also tended to notice is that they seem to have really intact upland plant communities that also had a lot of native species as well. So this is something that we're really interested in exploring more to kind of understand the connection of having a really intact native upland plant community and how that could influence the biodiversity in the intertidal below it. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Jacobs to talk about her plant research on Yerba Buena Island. Oh, you're muted, Sarah. I was going to try so hard not to do that, and I still <laughs> did it. So sorry. Um, yeah, so just to give you a heads up, uh, Allison's going to run the slides for me. So you're going to hear me going, next slide, next slide, um, which is probably good since I forgot to mute in the first place. But anyway, um, you know, building on what Allison uh, kind of just said, this association between um, the high intertidal biodiversity and an intact rocky shoreline um, likely extends up into that plant community too. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Like um, we expect that places that are less disturbed are going to be um, uh, full of native species. They're gonna have higher uh, biodiversity. And this is something that we are recognizing to be wildly important, uh, not just for human health and uh, for our enjoyment of natural spaces, but also for um, the health and, and well-being of all of the other organisms that we share the Bay Area with, right? And so, you know, as, as Allison mentioned, um, the folks who are, are tasked with managing uh, Yerba Buena Island into the future are really concerned about these, um, these places of biodiversity. And, they're, and this is a very important element for them. Next slide. So, um, you know, as Yerba Buena does continue to develop, these intact places of, of biodiversity are the ones that we're kind of training our eyes on to keep track of through time. Next slide. So um, my little bit of land on Yerba Buena Island that I'm working on uh, is here at the southwestern tip of the island. So it's uh, circled in red. And my main goal is to just try to understand what plant species exist there right now. And I'm also really curious about what plant species were there historically, because understanding how communities have changed through time can help us provide us the best type of information to those managers who are trying to make good decisions uh, for these areas. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of information, um, like firm information about what exact species were in these areas. 
uh, historically, but we can make some pretty educated guesses. Next slide. So given some of the information that uh, Allison mentioned earlier, who are my pictures gonna pop up? Next slide, there you go. <laughs> um, you know, we, we kind of expect that historically, these areas were composed of oak woodlands, open parklands, uh, coastal scrub, riparian scrub, things like that. Uh, next slide. Um, the reason why we don't have any kind of like formal way to know what species were there is because there are no actual uh, herbarium records. Um, we really are going just on uh, oral histories and, and commentaries about what these um, communities look like. So for those of you that haven't seen a herbarium specimen before, uh, this is an example of one taken from our collection here at CAS. And they're basically just dried pressed plants that are mounted onto a sheet of paper uh, with a collection label. And so I've zoomed into the collection label in the top right of the screen. And we can gain a ton of information about plants um, from these collections. Not only what the plant has been identified as, but also where it was collected, when it was collected, what it looked like, the habitat, what it looked like, where it was collected. And if we amass this information over many different types of collections, we can build a really rich understanding of what these communities looked like. Uh, next slide. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't exist currently uh, in um, our herbarium. And so one of my major goals as part of this project is to begin to create those resources so that they can inform uh, future decisions. Next slide. So basically, I my my job on this little part of, of Yerba Buena is to identify all of the plant species that are found here uh, to create herbarium specimens for them. And then um, ultimately, this will all just provide rich information to the folks uh, who are managing these populations. And this is really important in the face of anticipated future disturbances uh, you know, that correspond with, for example, development. Next slide. Um, but this isn't the only type of disturbance that can happen in spaces like this. I think it's really easy, especially in urban environments, to think that it's a lot of just um, development or roads or things like that that can uh, create disturbance. But there are a lot of natural processes that can also do this. Um, for example, Yerba Buena Island actually experienced a wildfire. Uh, so in June of 2020, uh, a fire started uh, on the, the peninsula that I'm working on. And, and it burned um, for a couple of days. And this is a picture of, of part of that. Uh, and you can see kind of the, the scorched earth. Um, and, it, and it did remove a lot of the uh, above ground plant material. Next slide. So this is a, a view uh, immediately after the fire from inside the uh, oak woodland. Um, looking out towards the city, and you can see that, again, most of the above ground plant material was gone, uh, and, and all of the plants that were living on the surface, you know, uh, are gone too. Next slide. And this is another example. So we can see kind of the standing um, dead trees, uh, and again, no plants. <laughs> um, big areas like this do create kind of an open ground for uh, plants to regenerate and to come back into the community. And in, in really native plant communities, um, those plants come from the seed bank, uh, from all of the seeds that the, the earlier plants have dropped into the ground. All of this open space is perfect opportunity for them to, to, to regrow. But in um, disturbed places and urban places, uh, invasives can also come in and, and really take over. Next slide. So this is just a couple of examples of some of the invasive species that uh, we're dealing with out at Yerba Buena. So this is Oxalis on the left and Ayrharta on the right. Um, and these are two species of plants that um, are uh, particularly good at uh, being invaders. They have these root systems where if you pull the plant out, but you happen to leave some of the roots behind, which is actually pretty easy, um, they can grow new plants. And so this is one of those moments where we have to kind of be on top of it as soon as possible to remove the plants from the system. Next slide. But it's, it's also the case that some of our potentially native species can also be kind of a pain. Um, so here I am at the top of the peninsula just a month ago, and you can see that there's been a ton of regrowth, which is great. We're gonna talk about this more in just a second. 
But all of the plants that you see here are almost exclusively a member of the nightshade family, the genus Solanum, which is the, the flowers of which are on the right there. And, um, and, and this is just an example of how even sometimes native plants can make it difficult for other members of the community to take hold. Next slide. It's been really encouraging to see how the plant community has responded uh, after the fire. Um, so uh, here again on the left, we can see the hillside where uh, you see a lot of the um, plant matter was removed by the fire. You notice that there's kind of like a little road um, along that hillside. And the picture on the right is, a, is taken from um, that road where I'm looking up the hill slope. And you can see all of these plants have started popping up um, in this area. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, another image from in the oak woodland um, and, and on the right, uh, an image from that same, approximately that same spot um, just a few months ago. And, and again, seeing all of these plants regrow has, has been really great. Um, one of the plants that um, I've really gotten to know and uh, appreciate and that is doing incredibly well right now at Yerba Buena uh, is Philostoma. This is the Fiesta flower. This is a member of the Baraginaceae. One of my favorite things about it is that it uh, it has these really coarse, stiff hairs, which you can kind of see in the, the picture on the right. It feels like Velcro when you touch it and it it sticks to your clothes and your pants and your hands. And um, anyway, this particular plant, it, it has a pretty broad distribution, but it's place at Yerba Buena Island is the only place in San Francisco County where it still exists. And what's more, uh, in other places, are, there are very few other places in the Bay Area where this particular species grows. So, so it's, its community there on your Babuena really is kind of a satellite, um, an oasis in this very big urban area um, for this particular species. Next slide. There's lots of other really beautiful wildflowers out there. Um, this is Dipterostema or the blue dicks. Um, there's a huge field of them on the western slopes of, of the island, um, and they're super happy right now. It's really nice to see. Next slide. There are a number of other species uh, similar to Philostoma who are not widely found across San Francisco. Um, and again, um, these guys all together are in a community um, of, of native plants. Uh, that's really unique in San Francisco County and, a, and like I said earlier, an oasis uh, in this urban environment. So here we have, um, oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> We've got uh, elderberry, oak, and osoberry. These are some of our woody species. Um, and then I also wanted to throw this kinopodium on here, the, the California goosefoot. This is a really um, a cool plant as well. The other thing I like about these pictures, especially the two on the left, is that it's it's showing how these these trees are re-sprouting even after this really devastating, uh, apparently devastating fire. Okay, next slide. So you know I've, I've mentioned that we don't know a ton about what these plant communities look like right now, and that's a that's a kind of a broad statement. Um, the the thing is is that we have been out there looking at these plant communities and observing the the plants in these communities for a number of years. Uh, so this is just a screenshot from earlier this afternoon of all of the um, INAT observations that have been made on Yerba Buena Island. Uh, you know, over well since INAT started, I guess. But you can tell that the, um, the date of some of these most recent observations are from earlier this month, and this was a bioblitz that. Um, that we participated in. Um, and, you know, this has been a really great way to get a handle on what species are likely out there. But, but observations like these do have limitations associated with them. So, for example, the next slide. Um, many species of plants require multiple stages of their life cycle in order to put accurate identifications on the plant. Um, a great example is the nightshade that I mentioned earlier. So this is the, a species of Solanum. And in this particular group, you need both the flowers and the fruits. So I made a collection of this plant when it was in flower. I took pictures of the fruits that day and you can see them there on the left. They're tiny, they're green, they're completely immature. So they're not useful as a diagnostic character for species um, identification. So I'm gonna need to go back there in a couple of months, collect another specimen that has the mature fruits so that we can formally put an identification on it. 
These collections will of course go into the herbarium and will become part of that vouchered collection um, that will uh, help us to describe the plant community both now and into the future. Okay, that's the end of my part of the presentation. And um, yeah, I hope we have time for a question or two. I'm sorry if I talked too long. Hey y'all, that was great. Um, I'm like smiling back here because it's a delight to watch all these, you know, photos of species and and get to know what's in our uh, our local Bay Area. Um, yeah. And we do have time for just a couple questions. So, um, Allison, first one's for you. Are all those seven species that you showed um, native Californian species, and where are they usually found? And are there similar analogs in other parts of the Bay to those particular? Yeah, you know, so yeah, all seven of those species are native California species. You know, the interesting thing is that while San Francisco Bay itself is a pretty, pre pretty highly invaded place, um, it's really on those kind of like more man-made structures that we find a lot of those non-natives and places that have a lot more open coast influence, you know, places where there actually will be waves sometimes, you know, on stormy days and things like that. Um, that tend, we tend to not see non-natives get established in places like that. There's a couple that are starting to do that in, in the Bay, but um, on the whole, those uh, uh, natives tend to do much better on these like more open ocean influence sites. Yeah, so all seven of those are native California species. Um, almost all seven of those would be species that you would find normally on the open coast. Like if you went out to the tide pools, like in Half Moon Bay, for example, um, you could find almost all of those species. The one really interesting one is that... Um, polychaete that makes like the basket hood on its head. That is interestingly normally a base species that we find in like sandy areas. It tends to burrow into the, into the sand. And so it was actually really interesting to find it on the western shore of Yerba Buena Island. Um, and for whatever reason, though, it hasn't been documented in San Francisco Bay. So that's places like if you go to Bodega, Bodega Bay, for example, you can find those like sticking out of the sand in Bodega Bay. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So cool. Um, and Sarah and uh, when, when you're collecting and deciding what to collect, how do you do that in a way that's like balanced and not gonna? <laughs> yeah, disrupt? that's a that's a really great question, and it's something that we think a lot about when we are making collections. Um, when I was trained uh, back in my early days <laughs> as a young botanist, um, we learned I learned a, a process called uh, one for ten or something like that. But the point was is that you wouldn't take an individual unless there was a, a good population that was still there um, after you've removed an individual. And you know there, there might be reasons why you would break that rule, but for the most part, we try very hard to not um, remove important members of the population when we are making collections. There are also ways that we can take the diagnostic features of the plant and make a collection without actually killing the plant. And that's mm -hmm. often a technique that we do use in those cases with rare species or um, species that we're worried about population sizes. Um, sometimes you you simply are breaking off the flower or a leaf, things like that. Um, nowadays, when we can uh, kind of increase our collections with lots of additional types of data, like pictures, for example, the combination of pictures with those diagnostic features can create a, a lasting record that is. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to take the actual individual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout out to iNaturalist. Shout out to Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, and one of the beautiful things about the collections combined with iNaturalist is that, you know, these be do become informative together. Like they are best when they are used together. And if we know what species of selenum that is, um, as we continue to see it through the years, you know, we can you know, have a pretty good idea that it's the same species. Um, but but beautifully, we can go back to the collection to confirm the identification of, of selenum uh, by looking at the specimen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, um, thank you both so much for a phenomenal yeah. presentation. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for being here tonight. And next, we are going to bring up Chris Shell to close us out. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, everybody, and, and thank you all for allowing me to, to wrap with you guys a little bit about some of the work we have been doing here in the Bay Area, as well as kind of the overall gist of what we do.
and we're, we're very much really excited to get going here. Um, so I just started at the University of California, Berkeley this past year, and we've been hitting the ground running and thinking about how nature and society intersect, which is why I titled today's talk, Bay Area Nature, Exploring How Society and Nature Coexist, which it is important for us to think about, especially in such an urbanized area, this question of what exactly is nature. So as you heard from many of the speakers earlier, we have quite a bit of just intrinsic value and love for what nature is, um, but it's important to kind of identify it in a way that helps center this conversation. And the reason that all of this is important is because we live in an environment in a local area, a region that's pretty highly urbanized. Some folks, maybe about 20 years ago, would have said that this right here is not nature. And yet, if you were to take a look, say, for instance, at all of the bird species that exist at Lake Merritt, so this is in Oakland, right? So one of the islands that's man-made was created. There are multiple hundreds of bird species that are hosted at these islands. And around, just in Lake Merritt alone, there are 10,000 plus human residents. So in environments that we previously would have thought, traditional ecologists would have said, there's no way that any, any organism of any value, right? And we'll get to that in a little bit, of any value would be able to survive in a city like Oakland, and yet they do. Turn to one of the lab's favorites and one of my personal favorites, coyotes. Likely many of y'all have seen these signs throughout San Francisco or the East Bay, alerting you to the fact that there are coyotes in your neighborhood. And who would have thought that you would have a mesocarnivore as relatively large as a coyote, not only surviving in cities, but thriving in cities, finding a way to make SF and the East Bay their vibrant homes. And yet, ironically, so many folks don't know that they're there. Here's a video. For many of y'all, you've likely been to Bernal Heights. This was a video taken about a couple weeks ago. There's a coyote over here to the left. She's kind of meandering behind this guardrail. There is a bystander about 20 yards away, walking, talking on his phone, has his ear pods in his ears, has no clue that the animal is there. So many folks don't realize that they live that close to wildlife. Let's take another example. That one hits kind of close to home for us here at Berkeley. For those of y'all that are not familiar with the kind of iconography of Campanile, that's this tall building right here. It sits relatively in the center, at least it's tall enough to feel like it sits in the center of campus. And on the center of campus, on this building, there have been peregrine falcons that have made their home on top of the building. The entire campus of Berkeley is their territory. And this story has become so endearing with the public that not only do the animals have names, Annie and the late Grinnell, but they also have stories. They also have narratives. So Annie, for instance, the mother of the pair was sort of wedded to Grinnell, the male peregrine falcon. But recently, Grinnell had died, maybe about a month and some change ago. Not only was it sort of a sad event for all of Berkeley, but you could see it, you could feel it because there were flowers put together, art made, a, a veritable funeral for Grinnell. Remarkably, and it should be noted, that peregrine falcons normally breed for life, right? And if one of the two of a pair ends up dying, then the other survivor has their territory taken over by intruders and said survivor has to find another territory. It just so happens that Berkeley is prime real estate. What's so endearing about this story is that another male flew in, he's now named Alden, and started to feed Annie, started to lay on the eggs, and now is the de facto stepfather of the eggs that currently are being sat on right now. So just as a point of fact, this right here is a live streaming video at 8.02, so right now, where we are looking at Alden being a good dad, laying on those eggs as a good adoptive dad. So 
again, these stories help us really connect in a way that, and yes, I know I'm giving all of the cute and the fuzzies, and I apologize to my previous speakers because they didn't have as many charismatic megafauna, although the butterflies were extraordinary, right? These stories help us to connect to what we conceive of as nature. Biodiversity and wildlife serve as that entry point, not just for, say, adults, but also for kids. And my kids included, my four and six-year-old, which you likely hear in the background getting ready for bed. They, too, are finding these connections in order to feel pride and joy in their nature. And it should be noted that the reason that biodiversity is so important is because it serves as the de facto shield, if you will. Many of y'all that have heard me give a talk before know that I'm a huge Marvel fan. So I like to drop references every once in a while. And here it seems pretty apropos because biodiversity in an intact system provides so many ecosystem services, regulating services, value-driven services for us, right? For human society. And when systems are more biodiverse, they're able to maintain the health and the overall function of that ecosystem, which we very much depend on. So quite a bit of what California has been interested in is taking a look at how do we create pathways by which we can serve natural lands as well as urban landscapes to get to this point where we are able to be a hub for biodiversity conservation. It should be noted that in many of the conversations, workshops, and talks that are still ongoing around California's 30 by 30, what was centrally located at every document and every point was the idea of equity and people. More specifically, that human beings are the directors and the audience of this adapted screenplay. I like to joke that we are the Lin-Manuel Miranda of this joint. Not only did we cast all the cast members, not only did we compose the rotating stage, not only did we put together all of the songs, we also are acting in this play. And traditionally, ecology and biodiversity conservation would take us out of the equation. And now there is a new movement to put ourselves back into that equation. So what does that look like? Well, if we incorporate ourselves, we try and understand how society, things like politics, economy, transportation and infrastructure, then influence things like habitat modification, connectivity, and even more things like preference and selection, how animals select what specific habitats they're going to call home. So then that if we were to break it down and what social ecological systems are, how society and ecology is connected, one, it helps us to understand how societal systems influence how resources and disturbances therein, as many of y'all had seen in the previous talks, are not necessarily evenly distributed, or in many instances, they're man-made. Like, for instance, think about the islands that were created by people that now serve as a hub for plants and animals. Environmental health, again, of a city is intimately tied to human-animal environment interactions. Ironically, um, all folks that study, say, One Health, this connection between people, animals, and our environment are essentially just sitting back and patting themselves on the back, sort of, because we have the biggest case study of COVID-19, which is a zoonotic disease, influencing and shaping the way in which nature and society are structured. And then finally, past legacies, right? The way in which society operated 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years ago, many folks would say 100 years ago, what, what does that have to do with today? And yet the way our cities are structured influences how animals move across the city or how they interact with people or what other organisms they interact with all of which is important to how they survive in the city. So it should be noted that this is a multi kind of disciplinary effort. You need to do quite a bit of social science work, natural sciences work in order to make the links between how society and nature coalesce with each other. And that's exactly what we do in the Shell Lab. So we study how ecology and societal factors affect biodiversity and evolutionary ecology in cities. And we specifically look at three hypotheses that help us to understand how biodiversity is structured within cities. 
The first being this luxury effect, this idea that socioeconomic status oftentimes positively predicts the number of plant species and the number of animal species that you see in cities. Contrast that with the legacy effect, this idea that past events and previous phenomenon influence current social and ecological patterns and processes. And then finally, this idea of the ecology of prestige, where at a more fine scale level, households and individuals collectively make decisions based on the way in which they would like their system structured. Now, I don't have much data on all of this yet, but I do have some, again, charismatic megafauna to show y'all today because as many of the administrators had made mention, Aria and Christina had dropped that we just got some data from camera traps that we had out in the field. So I'm gonna show y'all some of the video data and the still images that we got literally just this morning. But generally, how do we approach these hypotheses? Well, we use the three C's I like to call them. Camera traps, which you see over here to the left, carcasses that we opportunistically collect from say roadkill sources, and then GPS collars. So that way we can see how animals move across the city with each of these levels giving us different inferences as to what we can understand about how wildlife populations are living in cities. Camera traps allow us to understand population level dynamics and how communities interact with each other as well as with the urban landscape. The carcasses essentially serve as a, we don't waste a, a thing, right? We take every piece of the tissue, we then prepare the tissues, we prepare the skeletons so we can use them for educational purposes. We take the hair so we can measure hormone assays and see how stressed or not stressed the animals were in urban environments. We can take tissue samples to understand what is the genetic relatedness of those animals in relationship to many of the urban characteristics of the city. And then finally, the collars allow us to see, well, where are the animals moving? How are they responding in real time to what's being thrown at them on a daily basis? I should say I buried the lead here a little bit. It's not necessarily three C's. There's an additional fourth C, which is the community, right? All of y'all provide the fourth C, which is incredibly important. I should note that these two videos that you see right here were provided by community members. The one of the raccoon scaling the fence and the one of these cute coyote puppies about three weeks old coming out of their den, which is right underneath the house. So we use wildlife sightings quite a bit from community members, whether it's through iNaturalist, Nextdoor, or other sorts of sighting apps and websites to then take a look at how are people perceiving the animals? How likely are you to see that organism if you're in that environment? And what does that mean moving forward for how we coexist with these animals? Okay, so I did promise y'all some data. So let's, let's get into what some of the data look like, specifically for the camera traps that we've had out in the field. So as you see here in this photo, we have a camera trap just strapped to a tree and we have been using wildlife camera traps to non-invasively capture where animals are going throughout a city. And we've done this not only as say a local effort here in SF and in the East Bay, but also have been doing it as a larger collective of folks doing wildlife camera trap efforts. So before I get into that larger group, I'll just note here what you're seeing are two different transects here in the East Bay that essentially extend from Pinole all the way down to the midpoint of Oakland. And each of those dots represents a camera. So we are putting cameras all throughout the city to try and see what's the likelihood that we say maybe see a coyote at what time? Maybe what is the likelihood that we see competition between coyotes and foxes? What about foxes and domestic cats? Which as y'all can imagine, there are quite a few outdoor cats out there and they're all over the place. Well, what about say other carnivores like skunks or maybe opossums? How are deer moving in relationship to the urban environment? All of that then gets wrapped into not just a local, but also a national narrative. So under the Urban Wildlife Information Network, which is this larger group of camera trap biologists, wildlife ecologists, and the like, 
we have been getting out into the field across multiple cities, 35 and counting, doing what you see here, right? So this is us here locally setting up cameras in Blake Garden, up in the El Cerrito Kensington area, as well as Point Pinole over to the Pinole area, right? Richmond Pinole and several of the students that are in the lab helping set up those cameras for many other different projects. Maybe the projects, maybe how do species interact with each other and how do certain species, mammalian predators in particular, influence the bird biodiversity along shorelines? Or another question, how exactly are animals behaving across different gradients of environmental health? Or even better yet, how are these animals behaving or responding to particular cognitive tasks, depending on how disturbed or challenging their slice of the environmental pie is. If you're in a more urban environment, do you tend to be better at solving tasks or not so good? And what does that mean for all of the underlying factors that contribute to influencing your behavior? So then we had awesome videos like this one. So this is one of the first videos I'll show you that was taken out at Blake Garden. Here's a coyote on October 18th this past year at 3.38 in the morning. This fence line is a fence line right up against a residential area. So coyotes, even though you, you know may have a fence, can easily come in and out of those fences. As you'll see, the animal kind of comes in, checks out the area, sees the camera, could care less sniffs the area and we don't catch it fully on this video but as the animal sniffs the area it then marks the area because it probably smelled us we came in a few days before this and this coyote was like i'm not having it i don't want it to smell like this so marked its territory we would later find a couple days later on another one of our cameras also at blake garden the coyote pair. So here is a coyote pair that's moving through this environment. What's really interesting about Blake Garden and speaks to the intersection between society and nature is that these animals are most active during the periods of time when Blake Garden is closed. So you will, we, will, we haven't seen really any or many videos of coyotes between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. But right after 4 p.m., it's time to play. And they are out doing their thing. But we don't just get coyotes. We also get foxes. So here is a video also on the 18th. This fox came in right before the coyote did. And you may notice a little bit of difference in the behavior of this fox. Feels like it's a little bit more timid, right? So as it walks through the area, takes a couple steps, sniffs, looks around, quite a bit more sniffs. We would rate this as higher vigilance, right? So foxes tend to have higher vigilance, especially in areas where coyotes are because canids, so think wolves, think coyotes, think dogs, they tend to be hyper-aggressive across species, meaning that wolves will oftentimes depredate or kill coyotes. Coyotes will depredate foxes. And that's in large part in order to release resources that may or may not come into conflict between the two. And with resources being limited, uh, it makes sense to kill your competitors. So this fox is being very wary of what potentially could be around the corner and is walking slow enough and sniffing enough to see what's happening, right? But this is all just seeing how the animals are acting without us disturbing them in any way or without us challenging them. What does it look like if we were then to put together an assay where we can behaviorally test how the animals are responding? So that's exactly what we did. So here what you're seeing is an assay that's been used by some of our colleagues previously in Colorado and other places where it's a very simple novel object. We just take four fence posts, we put them in a square, we take twine and we tie the twine around those fence posts and just see how likely is it that an animal will either come into contact with, cross into the center of, or go around the object. It should be noted that these two raccoons that you see could care less that this is up. They would be exhibiting incredibly bold behaviors because to go through an object that they've never really seen before, 
takes quite a bit of gumption. You you need a little bit of risk in, inherent to get through this object and hopefully not have anything hurt or harm you. Compare that to this video of this coyote. Now, granted, the coyote certainly still goes through the center, but is a little bit more wary when it does so. Kind of walking a little bit slower when it's switching its ears back and forth. It's paying attention to what's happening as it's moving through the environment. Compare that to the raccoon as it moved through the environment. Those two raccoons, again, could care less. So we are able to then take these assays from the East Bay to SF and try and understand how is boldness varying across the environments. And that is led by one of my graduate students, Cesar Estian, who is then going to see, well, does that vary from say non-urban sites? Who knows? And then certainly we get not just great videos, but great photos as well. These are photos that if you take a look at the date, right? April 11th, 2022. So these are some of those photos I was telling you all about that we just got from out of the field. These three are, have been taken at a cemetery in the Kensington, El Cerrito area, and there are deer. Deer are everywhere. Um, we tend to find them quite a bit, and in large part because as great as it is to have coyotes as essentially those keystone species that we need, right, carnivores that we need in order to regulate the system, they don't oftentimes take out large deer, especially not adults and especially not bucks. So deer, <laughs> they know that. And as you can see, this deer is just taking a lick at the camera. This deer, I don't really understand why it's so close, but really wanted to be close. This individual right here probably laid in front of the camera for about three hours. Now, granted, this is a cemetery that is closed at night. We don't just set up at cemeteries. We also set up camera traps at golf courses. We also set up camera traps at green spaces near BART stations. We also set up camera traps in people's backyards and in their front yards. Good example. These two photos that y'all see are from a house from a private resident that allowed us to put a camera up in this small square of green space. This is probably no more than a couple square feet. It's relatively tiny. And yet, even the things that are common they still tend to find their way over here. So here is a squirrel over to the left and a raccoon over to the right. And many folks will say, well, you look at this yard, you don't inherently expect it to be some type of habitat for wildlife. And yet wildlife are using those spaces to say, climb up trees, use the trees as nesting materials or mark their territory. That's what this raccoon right here is doing. Even small yards like this still have a lot of biodiversity value. And understanding that allows you to understand our value and taking local pride within the wildlife that come in and out of our cities. So we have an excellent team. Not all of them are pictured here, but many of them are. And we're doing quite a bit of work from many of the assays y'all saw with the camera traps to looking at how fecal samples tell us a lot about the diet of the animals to trying to understand how differences in personality of those animals influence how they adapt to cities, all the way to what does the population genetic structure of these animals look like and what can that tell us about how the city is structured and how we can build the city better. So with that, there are so many folks to acknowledge, including all the folks that tuned in today, and I'll open for any questions y'all have. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, it's so awesome to have you back on the program. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so what, can you tell us a little bit more about the role these particular megafauna play in cities and like why is it important to to have them here yeah that's a great question christina so carnivores generally are are bio indicators and keystone species so what does that mean right let's imagine that we were to take all of the carnivores that are in the bay area out of the bay area what happens well you end up having what's called a trophic cascade, 
Meaning, let's just play this scenario out a little bit. There are tons of deer. There are rabbits. There are cats. Many of them would be eaten or depredated by those carnivores. But now the carnivores are gone. So it's free reign for them. They can eat whatever they want, whenever they want, right? That's great for them. Not so great for the plants that get eaten a lot, maybe more than they should, especially the native plants. Those native plants tend to be homes for a lot of native birds and invertebrates. They're gone now too, because a deer just ate their homes. What about the what about the cats, right? Well, the cats, they're gone too. You know, the cats are going to be eating more and more of those native birds and rodents. So as a daily PSA, as y'all probably know, you're tuning in, you're thinking, yeah, that's why we keep our cat indoors, right? Exactly. You keep your cat indoors, you help solve that potential biodiversity crisis. And yet we still have cats outdoors that are eating many of those species. They doubly get hammered. That costs money. Quite a bit of money. So much conservation funds goes into saving habitats for birds, amphibians, small rodents. So when we take away their homes and they're being hammered by getting eaten, then that costs. That also degrades the ecosystem, which also continues to cost us in our health. So having those carnivores serves as essentially free pest management services seed dispersers, and allows to tamp down on a number of prey species to then allow for more biodiversity to, to exist. Thank you for that amazing explanation. Um, Jean asks, how do we know species when species are truly thriving in human-dominated land? Yeah, great question. We take a couple of measures. One is how reproductively successful they are. So, for instance, many urban species, when they get into urban environments, or if they already are there, we measure how many offspring they're having year after year. And for all of the organisms that we talked about today, all of them tend to have a greater number of offspring in cities than they do outside of cities. Coyotes are a good example. In yeah. cities, including in, in San Francisco, Coyotes, even if they have, say, a home range about the size of three kilometers, they collapse that down to one kilometer. And whereas coyotes normally in non-urban environments would have somewhere between three and six pups, sometimes in cities they can have up to 11 pups and be able to raise all of them. So that's in large part due to the fact that there are more natural prey. So there are things like all of the rodents that they can eat, as well as human food subsidies, which... Daily PSA, we shouldn't be feeding wildlife, but it ends up happening anyway. And those animals capitalize on it. Great, thank you. Um, and then what, and then so coyotes, obviously people, you know, when they when we see them in, in the city, it's always a thrilling experience that people wanna know, um, has there been an increase or decrease in the Bay Area recently, because there was all those stories, right, when the pandemic started, like, nature is back. Um, yeah. What have you seen? Yeah, it, it may be a little bit of both, right? So it may be that the population is increasing and that we just see them more because we're paying attention more. Granted, as I showed you all in the video, not everybody is paying attention to them, but yeah. we, we will certainly be investigating that. So what do population numbers look like? How big is the population? There are relative estimates that haven't been validated yet, but certainly with much of the work that we're doing non-invasively and you know, camera traps, fecal transects, carcasses, understanding genetics will allow us to understand how abundant the animals actually are in the city. Great. And then finally, um, what are the, you know, if people see wildlife, in their in their yard or and they're noticing a lot how can and they want to help you with your research how do you find this community um provided video and and how can it be used yeah certainly sending us an email is always great so if there's ever anything y'all see you're welcome to just shoot us an email and we will gladly credit you for the video if you see wildlife too and oftentimes folks will ask us if i see this animal what should i do or if i see this animal what should i do Oftentimes, it's it's fairly simple for some of the smaller organisms. So 
it sounds like it's cruel, but the word hazing, many of y'all may have heard it before, is not hazing in the frat or the sorority sense, but rather instilling a relative healthy fear or respect between you and the organism. So when you see a coyote, for instance, many of y'all, if you have small dogs or cats, the best thing for you to do is raise yourself up, make yourself as big as possible, and like clap at the animal. The worst thing you can do is try and pet the animal or walk towards said animal, right? But allowing for that healthy fear allows for the animal to coexist in the environment and you to kind of enjoy the fact that they're there, which it should be noted that if you have a coyote in your neighborhood, you're doing pretty darn good. Like your neighborhood is pretty healthy. So take that as a consolation, if you will, that being able to have or host a carnivore in your urban environment means that your urban environment isn't as sick as we may have thought it to be, but it's it's doing quite well. That's a wonderful note to end on, and I'm going to feel so good if I see a coyote near my house. Um, what's your lab's email that people should, I'll put it in the comments. Yeah, for sure. I'll just put that right here. Or at least this is this is my email. <laughs> so we are hopefully going to be getting a lab email for folks to send some of that information. But of, of course, iNaturalist is always great. We take a look at iNaturalist consistently. Both the city of San Francisco and the city of Oakland are collecting data about where sightings are for the animals and they're logging those sightings accordingly. Um, and there are several other features in different programs that kind of replicate the same type of sighting kind of expertise, if you will. So mm -hmm. always feel free to take that information and run with it. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Chris. Wonderful to have you on. Um, and I'll bring Aria back. Have a good night. Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Just like smiling over here, thinking about the coyotes I saw walking around my street a few nights ago. <laughs> but um, um, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. I was just trying to put Chris's email in the in the chat do email him if you yes. if you have a sighting um thank you so much to Darrell and Chris Grinter and Allison Young and Sarah Jacobs and Chris Shell for an amazing evening um yeah yeah and night school um as some of you may know but just as a reminder is coming to you now the first and third Thursdays of every month and we will be back next on May 5th with a program that we're calling Earth to Astronomy, which is gonna be focused on star and planet focused storytelling. So um, yeah, tune in for that. That's when you'll see us next. Yeah, we haven't had an astronomy one for a while. So tell your astronomy loving friends and um, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you will be notified when we come back. Um, you can also subscribe to Nightlife emails on the Academy yeah. website. Um, but thank you so much. The recording is going to go right on YouTube when we end here. Have a wonderful evening. Um, hope you're all well. Yes. Good night. Take care.